Hello everyone. Today I want to give you a glimpse of Indian economy from 1947 till today. We are going to talk about every major event in very brief. This will give you a very good outline about how Indian economy has performed, what have been the lows and what have been the highs in the past 75 years. Let us begin. Firstly, what about Hindu rate of growth? You must have heard about this event, uh, this term, but we often tend to misjudge it or feel or think that this has anything to do with Hinduism as a religion. Well, this is not the only term uh, that has been given to India or any other country around the world. There have been similar terms which have been given to other nations as well, like Islamic Islamic rate of growth. Chinese rate of growth, Christian rate of growth, Jewish rate of growth. Basically, Hindu rate of growth was a term given by an economist Raj Krishna in 1978. And it wanted to talk about the low rate of growth in India between 1947 and 1990. We will understand very soon what are the major reasons behind this low rate of growth. What was the average growth rate in this time period? It was below 3.5%. Let's move ahead. Let's try and go back a little and understand what exactly happened in India before 1947 that laid a very weak foundation for low growth rate between 47 and 1991. The British came in India in 1700, 1707 to be precise and left in 1947. They claim to have introduced industrialization in India, but we will prove very shortly that indeed they de-industrialized India in, instead of industrializing our country. The stats also say otherwise. If we pick up a very basic stat, which is share of a country in world's income, we can easily and clearly see that in 1700, we had a 22.6% share in the total world income. Whereas in 1952, immediately after independence, the share of India in world income dropped to a mere 3.8%. This means a strong de-industrialization of our country. What are the major impacts of this mass de-industrialization that happened in about 200 years of British rule in India? Number one, abject poverty. We saw majority of Indians living in poverty. What does it mean? It means high inequality as well as unequal distribution of wealth, which means a very small number of very rich people majority of who were Britishers and a very large number of Indians who were living below poverty line in very bad conditions. At the same time, we also saw illiteracy, mass illiteracy in our country. At the time of independence, we had only 16% literacy rate, which means only 16% of the population could write their own name. That was the level of illiteracy in India. And number three, drain of wealth. This was explained by an economist, Indian economist, uh, Dadabhai Nairoji, and he said that the British exported money back to UK. They looted India by exporting not only various goods and services, but directly exporting the money that they earned in this country back to their own country. And this is how we were left in abject poverty. Let's move on. Let's move ahead now. Let's try and get to the starting or the basics of Indian economy from 1950 to 1960. What exactly happened after independence? There were three major events. Number one, the Planning Commission was created as an executive body in the year 1950 with some major purposes or objectives which were very good in intentions but they could not be realized completely. What were these objectives? Number one, to assess the resources. It was the responsibility of planning commission to assess various kinds of resources that India has as a nation. Because we were falling short of resources, whether it is educated human resources, whether it is capital resources or any other resources. Therefore, planning commission had to first figure out that our country resources hain kitne. How much money do we have? How much educated human resource do we have? Secondly, the responsibility of planning commission was also to formulate plans, formulating plans so that we could focus on a certain areas, determining the priorities among different sectors, because in no case we could have focused on everything in one go. Therefore, the planning commission's responsibility was to figure out 
what is important, what is not important or what is less important and how much resources to be allocated to various sectors. That was one of the major jobs of planning commission. Number three, promote standard of living. The primary objective of planning commission was to work in the direction so that people's standard of living could improve, so that people could have a better life and that was possible only by efficient exploitation of whatever available resources we had in our country. And number four, to increase production because higher production means higher GDP, higher GDP means higher income, higher income means higher savings and investments, automatically means higher development in the nation. So these were the major objectives with which planning commission worked. Secondly, the second major event that happened in India between 50 and 60 was the Haro Domar model. This was launched in the year 1951 and there were three major objectives or purposes of this model. Number one, it focused on agriculture and modern irrigation. The model realized that India lives or lives through its villages and lives through agriculture. Majority of employment is found in agriculture. Therefore, it said that we need to focus on modernizing agriculture and the first step in doing that is to introduce better irrigation technologies. Number two, increase savings ratio. Harodomar model was very simple in its format. It said higher savings means higher investment, higher investment means higher production. That ultimately means higher GDP, higher consumption and more growth for the economy. Therefore, it said encourage savings and investment to increase capital formation in the economy. And number three, it talked about increasing or improving capital output ratio, which means how much capital, how much input you have to put in, in order to create one unit of output. If you improve capital output ratio, it means less amount of capital required for one additional unit of output. So it said, let's try and focus on efficiency so that we can improve our capital output ratio. These were the three major objectives of Harut Domar model. But this was dumped very early in 1956 and it was replaced with another model which is a landmark model in the history of Indian economy called as Mahalanobis model. What exactly was this model about? Let's try and understand and then we'll have a look at the positive contributions as well as drawbacks of this model. There were two major focus areas of this model. Number one, it focused on heavy industrialization. It said we, if we want to be self-sufficient in production, we have to industrialize our economy heavily. If you do not industrialize, we will not be able to create capital goods. We will keep importing them and that ways we will not be self-sufficient. And if you are not self-sufficient, automatically our nation will break down. Number two, industrial policy resolution. In order to make this a reality, it came out with industrial policy resolution 1956, which is also called as economic constitution of India. And this industrial policy re resolution laid the foundation of India's industrial development. Let's have a look at the positives and negatives of Mahalanobis model through industrial policy resolution and various other initiatives. Number one, it did result in rapid industrialization in our economy. How? By creating a lot of public sector units and manufacturing capital goods, steel plants, iron ore plants, gas plants, all these were examples through which we created a strong industrial base for India. These were all public sector units. It could not have been done by the private sector because we did not have enough money in the private sector at that time. Number two, fiscal deficit financing. Now, in order to... One second, guys. Yes. In order to make this a reality, in order to spend so much money in order to invest so much in creation of public sector units, it was relevant to, to have that money from somewhere. And that is where fiscal deficit financing was brought in. Mahalanobis model said, we do not have that much money. We cannot rely on the private sector. People don't have that much money. So what do we do? We try and finance all this money by borrowing from the outside world, by borrowing from various other nations in the form of either loans or investments. That was one of the major focuses of the model as well. And number three, it said we need to create model temples. We need to focus on changing the kind of temples that we create. Instead of building actual temples, let's focus on the new temples of modern India in the nature of dams, IITs, atomic energy plants, steel plants, etc, etc. And this was made a reality. This is why we see such high growth in India 
today because we created these modern temples at that time. What are the major problems? And what are the good, the bad and the ugly? Number one, license Raj. What do you mean when you say license Raj? It means that if you want to start anything new, you have to get a license from the government. Let's say you want to start a new startup today. You want to start teaching. You want to build a robot. You want to build a drone. Then if you have to create, if you have to first take a license from the government and it takes almost a year to take that license, automatically your enthusiasm will die down. You will end up doing something else. This is why License Raj resulted in so much backlog in our economy. How was this License Raj brought into play, brought into reality? By creating three groups of industries, the government under Mahalanobis model said, let's create three different kinds of industries. Group one, which are strategic industries, which are going to be controlled directly by the government and only government can carry out activities in those industries. Number two, industries partially owned by the state could can be owned by the state as well, by the uh, private sector as well. And number three, consumer industries left to the private sector. Now, it looks hunky dory, but the problem is majority of the industries were placed under group one and group two, which meant the state had major control. And this license Raj system resulted in red tapeism. The outcome was red tapeism. What do you mean when you say red tapeism? It directly means that in order to take those licenses, you have to go to the bureaucracy, you have to go to those babus, just like in the uh, series office office and the end result is that they end up uh, taking a lot of corruption end up taking a lot of your time and efficiency of the economy as a whole goes down so this red tapeism was an outcome of license raj system end result is inefficiency in the system number two agriculture was left behind major problem of the mahalanobis model it focused so much on industrialization focused so much on manufacturing sector that it left agriculture to the private sector, but we have seen through historical uh, proofs as well, not only in India, but around the world that agriculture has never done well. If left only to the private sector, the government has had to interfere and intervene and invest in agriculture in order to promote it, in order to modernize it. So these were the major problems with Mahalanobis model. Let's move ahead. What happened in 1960s after Jawaharlal Nehru? Nehruji passed away in 1964 and after that Lal Bahadur Shastri took over the reins of the economy. He brought about various changes. Number one, a new development model focused upon green revolution was started because Lal Bahadur Shastri realized that if we want to modernize India, if we want to grow India, we have to grow our agriculture, we have to promote the farmers, we have to modernize and put in more income in the hands of farmers and that was possible only through technology. That is where Green Revolution came in. Dr. M. S. Swaminathan and Norman Bollo of Mexico, both these scientists came together and result was self-sufficiency to Indian agriculture. What do you mean when you say Green Revolution? Basically, introduction of high yield variety seeds. That is what we mean by Green Revolution. Today, Dr. Swaminathan says that instead of focusing only on green revolution, we have to transform, move one step ahead and now go towards evergreen revolution. Next, what were the major focus areas of Lal Bahadur Shastri? He realized that the government cannot survive on its own and the economy can move forward only through the private enterprises along with the government. So he started promoting private enterprises. The importance was again, once again, given to the private sector as well. Number three, foreign investment. He also realized that we cannot keep borrowing uh, forever. We have to give that loan back and there is interest involved. Therefore, instead of asking for loans from various other countries, why not ask for investment? Why not tell them that India is a growing economy? It is going to do well in the next 10, 20 years. You invest in India rather than loaning money to India. That was a change on, as to how we looked at money. Public funds could not be uh, uh, useful only alone in creating an advanced economy. We needed foreign funds as well. And number four, white revolution. Very, very important. Along with green revolution, Lal Bahadur Shastri also realized that if you want to increase the income of farmers, you need to give them more opportunities. And that was possible only through dairy industry because Literally every family, every farming family at that time owned cows and buffaloes along with their farms. It was led by 
Verghese Curian at that time. And we see Amul all around up as a result of white revolution. Let's move forward. These were the major contributions of Lal Bahadur Shastri. In 1960s, late 1960s and 70s, the era of Indira Gandhi began. And there were two major contributions. We can call them positive, we can call them negative. Number one, devaluation of rupee and number two, bank nationalization. In 1969, we nationalized banks in our country. 14 banks were nationalized. In 1980, six more banks were nationalized. Why were these banks nationalized? The major aim was financial inclusion. But what was the outcome and the problem? Crony capitalism. What do you mean when you say crony capitalism? It means collusion of capitalists, industrialists with the government to create a collusive environment wherein only those industrialists gain and the overall economy as well as the people lose. This was one of the major problems and outcomes of bank nationalization at that time. Number two, devaluation of rupee. What was the main purpose behind it? To expand exports of India. But it could not become a reality. Why? Because industrialization was already limited in India. Even after investing so much public funds, we could not industrialize to the extent we wanted to. And that is why we could not expand exports, even though we devalued our rupee. What was the major outcome or result? Inflation, because our imports became more costlier. Automatically, our import costs increased and that resulted in inflation in our economy. 1977, a major change. The Janta Party came into power. Three major steps taken by Janta Party. You can call it positive, you can call it negative, depends upon your perception. Number one, demonetization 1.0. Were rupees 1000, 5000, and 1000 notes were withdrawn. So, this is not the first time that we've had demonetization in 2016. It has also happened in the past. What are the major reasons behind demonetization? To reduce corruption and black money. The same reason before, the same reason even today. Second, trade union strikes were being made legal, legal because of uh, a, a, a government at the center that was more focused and more uh, favorable towards trade unions and labor class. Uh, major changes were brought in in trade union laws that resulted in legalization of strikes. What was the major outcome? The economic activity got hurt because now strikes became a regular phenomena. And this gave also rise to militant unionism wherein unionism uh, became more violent in nature and not just following non-violent strikes. Number three, foreign companies were asked to leave although this had been working behind the scenes for some time. In 1978, IBM and Coke, both these companies left India. But why these, did these companies leave? Number one, new FERA laws. Foreign Exchange Regulation Act demanded certain changes in the way they functioned in India and they did not agree. Therefore, they left. Number two, the Indian government claimed that these companies were selling old technology in India rather than selling the best and advanced technologies that they had already created and selling in the US. And they demanded that these countries should be selling either the latest technology or the old technology at cheaper rates. And number three, there was a widespread belief that computers were taking jobs from Indians and because we wanted to satisfy our voter base and we as political class were also influenced by that same opinion. We felt that yes, computers are taking jobs in India, taking over jobs in India and therefore we need to shut them out. So these were the major contributions of the Janta Party. In 1980, the reforms began. What are the major reforms? Rajiv Gandhi's major reforms. Number one, he was the one who brought in IT revolution back again in India. He was the one who brought in telecommunication revolution in India. Telecom uh, started booming. Industry, IT started booming. He was the one who focused on reducing direct taxes because he realized that Laffer curve is a reality. It is not just a theory. We will be reading about Laffer curve very shortly. These were, were the major contributions of the reforms carried out by Rajiv Gandhi. What was the outcome? Income started increasing in people. Consumption, savings and investments as a result started increasing. If your income is higher, you consume more, you save more and all that money goes into the system, results in higher investments. This ultimately started resulting in higher growth. Okay. What are the other major reforms, structural reforms that were carried out? Number one, license Raj was now beginning to fade. We were liberalizing the way companies could uh, start their enterprises, the kind of licenses that they, they were required to take from the government. 
Import duties were reduced in order to bring competition in our economy. Fiscal reforms were carried out to reduce large fiscal deficit, which means our borrowing started to go down because we realized that fiscal deficits is a reality, is a real problem, and we cannot keep borrowing money endlessly. Price controls were reduced and market-led economic growth was now pushed. So if an Indian company is not competitive enough, it was not supported to the extent it was supported before. These were the major changes. What else? A negative uh, event in this time period, Bhopal gas tragedy. We realized as a result of this tragedy, the difference between regulation and control. Till now, we had been trying to control the economy, but now we realized the importance of regulation. As a result, after 1991, a lot of independent regulatory agencies like SEBI and IRDA were created because we realized the importance of the difference between regulation and control and the relevance of regulation over control as well. What are the major challenges in 1980s, which resulted in the crisis of 1990s, 1991 specifically? Number one, interest cost of borrowing started increasing because the government had been borrowing too much. The government had to borrow money to meet its expenses, leading to high interest cost. We had to give out a major of our re revenues as interest only. We had to import a lot of defense because on one hand, we did not have the technology to be self-sufficient in defense. And at the same time, we lived, still live in a very hostile neighborhood. And therefore, we had to keep spending money, keep investing in defense as well. Number three, pensions. At that time, we focused upon and we followed a defined pension scheme wherein the people, the old people were given, given a, a defined amount of pension. This resulted in high cost for the government, for the exchequer. For now, we have moved from defined pension towards a defined contribution scheme. Food fertilizers and subsidies. We realized that a lot of money the government was losing because it had to give subsidies on food as well as fertilizers, both to the farmers as well as the consumers. A major reason which resulted in crisis of 1991. And at the same time, we also realized that all these PSUs we had created in the 1950s were now becoming loss making. They were not uh, turning around, they were not creating any profits for the government and therefore we had to start disinvesting. These were the major problems we started facing in 1980s as we started to reform our economy. Let's compare a little bit India versus China. From 1960s till today, what has happened? If we compare only the GDP growth rate or the overall GDP or production in the economy, then what do we see? In 1960, Chinese GDP was 128 billion, whereas Indian GDP was much more, much higher at 148 billion dollars. In 1978, China's GDP had risen to 293.6 billion and India's GDP was also at the same level at 293.2 billion. But what do we see today? We see in 2018, China's GDP has skyrocketed to 10.8 trillion, whereas India's GDP is 2.85 trillion. We can call it a 3 trillion economy. Even then, we are almost one third, even less than one third of China's economy today. So this is a reality now. Let's come to the crisis. What happened in the economic crisis of 1991? Please remember it was not a financial emergency. High fuel cost, number one, because of various external events, devaluation of our currency, etc., etc., we saw high fuel prices. This automatically meant more or higher cost of living for everyone and more expensive to transport goods. At the same time, we also saw that our dependence on imported fuel was not reducing. We were not able to produce, to extract that amount of fuel that we demanded in the uh, local economy, in domestic economy. And therefore, our imports kept increasing and our cost of import kept increasing. This meant requirement of more forex reserves which we ultimately did not have that resulted in india's economic crisis in 1991 okay what else revenue expenditures more than capital expenditures now we started reforming in 1980 but we saw a major problem at that time our revenue expenditures were much higher than our capital expenditures and when that was happening automatically the result was that we were spending on day-to-day -day activities instead of spending on creating capital goods and these day-to-day -day activities were not giving us any return in the future 
ultimately we were stuck in a situation where our fiscal deficits were very high and we did not know how to finance these deficits what was the solution by prioritizing capital expenditure and finding ways to reduce unnecessary spending which was basically revenue expenditure in order to create a more sustainable economy what happened in the crisis when we were in the middle of the crisis the forex reserves number 1 could cover only 19% of our imports so majority of our imports were necessary in the form of oil imports but we could cover only 19% of our imports we did not know how to how to get all these imports because we did not have any money left number 2 forex reserves could pay on, only for 3 weeks of imports normally we need forex reserves to have a cushion of 10 to 13 months of imports but at that time we did not know after 3 weeks how are we going to pay for our imports and we needed to we needed these imports because without these imports our economy would crash number 3 we had to pledge our gold to get loans from the united kingdom as well as imf this was the only way left through which we could get more loans from the uk and imf and transform our economy but imf said there are some con conditions you have to fulfill only then i will take this gold from you and give you money what were these conditions these are called as structural reforms that we carried out the short term for this or the in brief if i have to tell you these are called as lpg reforms liberalization privatization and globalization reforms what do they include number 1 disinvestment in psus which is nothing but privatization so we started privatizing our enterprises not only selling off the psus but also allowing the private entities to do whatever they wanted to do we carried out banking reforms through privatization of banks which is still going on the license raj system was gone which is nothing but liberalization now everybody in the economy was allowed now to do whatever he or she wanted to do without having the need to take license for everything from the government number 4 taxes were reduced because we realized the importance of laffer curve finally what is laffer curve it looks like this this means if you keep increasing your tax rate your revenue might go up for a certain time period till a certain extent but after this level if you increase your tax rate further your revenue will st start falling India was somewhere here where our tax rates were very high and as a result our revenues were very low and that is why we had to come back a little reduce our tax rate this is what we did after 1991 reforms number 4 majorly number 5 capital market and forex market reforms we could not grow only by borrowing endlessly or the public sector you know funding the need of growth of the country we also needed the capital market as well as the forex forex market to reform itself number one one major change that was brought about was new independent institutions in the form of sebi irda were created which regulated the capital markets better instead of controlled by the government and the current account convertibility convertibility was made free so that people could export and import freely without having to go to the government every time they wanted money they wanted dollars in order to either import or export 21st century what are the structural reforms now that we are witnessing in the past 5 to 10 years number one niti ayog what is it it is uh, a, a a a sequel we would say of planning commission whose main responsibility is to advise the states as well as the central government for growth and development and not to implement any policy that is to be left only to the central government and the state government to increase ease of doing business better planning as well as better analysis because it's an advisory body insolvency and bankruptcy code in order to encourage in order to strengthen our banks by managing their npas in a more structured format in a more organized format number 3 goods and services tax to ease out the tax system even further these are the major reforms that we are witnessing in the 21st century where do we see india's future if we want to be a global power we need to have sustainable models of energy and electricity why because we are majorly dependent on oil for our uh, energy needs and we have to import majority of that oil we cannot do it forever we need to create sustainable and domestic energy sources number 2 e-commerce in india is going to be a major boom it still is it has already started 
we need to push it further so that people can consume more invest more save more have better lifestyle their incomes can also increase and number three we need to adopt ai and automation as fast as possible without thinking about what could be the harmful effects because the faster we adopt ai the faster we are going to create jobs for our economy for our domestic economy at the global level so these are the three three major future reforms that we need for our economy to conclude india's economy has been doing well especially after 1991 we created a strong base between 47 and 91 yes we did some bad things we did not do everything right but the structural reforms that we're carrying out are certainly going to contribute towards our bright future this was all about uh, the entire history of indian economy in brief from 1947 till 2023 i hope you liked it if you did do not forget to subscribe to my channel all the best jai hind